Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all our friends attending from different parts of the world and to our speakers. Uh, this is our uh, third plenary session. This plenary session contains two keynote lectures. The first one would be delivered by Professor Gopal Madhubushi and the second one by Professor Tohata. This session will be chaired by yes. Professor Swami Saran and co-chaired by Dr. Ramakrishnan. Before I hand over the session to our uh, chair and co-chair, I would like to briefly introduce them. Uh, Professor Swami Saran is a well-known personality. He, his book is very popular. Most of us all studied uh, his books on soil dynamics. Apart from that, he has written several other books. Even till now, uh, he's very active. He's still, I just came to know a few months back, he has completed another book writing. So for uh, just uh, sake of formality, I will just um, brief uh, about him. Uh, Professor Swami Saran, Emeritus Fellow, retired from Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee, obtained his PhD in 1969. He established a teacher, an established teacher, researcher, and active consultant. He is the recipient of Kostler Research Award four times and IGS Award, including prestigious Kukulman Award and also awards from ICET, ISTE, and ISCMS. He has guided 29 PhD thesis, 84 master thesis, published 208 research papers and eight books. He has initiated research work on reinforced soil, analysis of foundation using constitu laws and dynamic analysis of retaining walls. He has provided consultancy to more than 300 projects of national importance. He visited the UK in 1974 under exchange program and AAT Bangkok as visiting professor in 1987. A national conference was organized at IIT Roorkee in 2007 to honor him. Considering his contributions, Indian Geotechnical Society conferred honorary fellowship on him in 2011. With this brief introduction, I welcome Professor Swami Saran to this session. To Thank you, Ravi. Uh, thank you, sir. I'm happy to sir. That you have given a chance to act as a chairman of this session in which two learned speakers are with us. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, and, yeah. sir uh, let me also introduce uh, our co chair, sir, Dr. Ramakrishnan. Dr. Ramakrishnan is currently working as a senior grade assistant professor at the Department of Civil Engineering, Amrita Vishwa Vidya Peetam, Coimbatore, India. He is a PhD from the Indian, Society, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and has extensively worked on geotechnical earthquake engineering, focusing on seismicity of Himalayas. His key areas of research include geotechnical earthquake engineering, slope stability, and soil stabilization. He has authored numerous research papers in peer-reviewed uh, international journals and conferences, and is a reviewer for various international journals. He is a passionate researcher and has carried out relevant and impactful research at this end age, which was well received with about 200 citations. With this brief uh, introduction, I welcome Dr. Ramakrishnan. Thank you, sir. Uh, Namaste. Thank you for yeah. inviting me to co chair this session. And extremely, uh, you know, I'm extremely honored to be here alongside uh, Professor Swami Sharan uh, to chair this session. And I would yeah. like to uh, extend my thank you to uh, all the organizers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oh, uh, yes, and now I request uh, Professor Swami Sharan and Dr. Ramakrishnan to take over the charge of the session. Thank Please, you sir. very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Now, actually, as I just mentioned, there are two speakers in this session. Both speakers are very learned one. 
and I will request them humbly to confine their presentation for about 45 minutes so that we have some time for discussion also. The first presentation will be by Professor Gopal Madhuvishi. I will briefly introduce to the audience about him. Professor Gopal is a professor of civil engineering at the University of Cambridge, director of Toffield Center, and also head of geotechnical and geo-environmental group. He has 20, over 25 years of experience in the area of soil dynamics and earthquake engineering. His expertise extends from dynamic centrifuge modeling to the time domain finite element analysis of earthquake engineering problems. He has an active interest in the areas of soil liquefaction and soil structure interaction. He provided leadership to earthquake engineering field investigation team. He was awarded many awards. To name the few, TKHA award three times, Shamche Prakash award two times, Medical Innovation Award, IGS ML Binal Award, and Bill Curtin Medal, IGS ONGNC Binal Award, etc. He has published more than 400 papers and also authored a book on design of pile foundation in liquefied soils. With this brief introduction, I invite Professor Gopal for his presentation. Oh, thank you very much, Professor Swami Sir. It's a real honor and privilege to be introduced by you. As uh, uh, the chairman has said, uh, Ravi was saying, we all grew up studying your book. So it's really uh, it gives me a great thrill that I was introduced by you. Let me start by sharing the screen and hope it all works. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Yes, My sir. screen or? Yes, yes. Okay, very good. So I need to go into presentation mode. Uh, and try to not see all the faces in one go. I'll try and keep it to the time as much as I can. And in case you feel that I'm overrunning, uh, please stop me, Professor Swami Saran, and I'll uh, wrap up at that point. Um, today I'm going to uh, speak about advances in modeling of soil system traction problems. And that's been the, the topic. And uh, I want to share with you some of the recent research we've been doing at Cambridge on this. Uh, the layout of, of the lecture uh, is uh, going to be like this. I'll start at the very uh, basics of what do we mean by soil section interaction. We then uh, shall look at dynamic soil section interaction. I'll briefly introduce uh, dynamic centrifuge modeling. A lot of you uh, must have heard uh, me do this before, so I'll try and keep the brief. And then I'll go uh, pick on a couple of uh, recent work. One is uh, looking at retaining structures. Uh, and for today, I picked anchored retaining walls and retaining walls with the structure behind on the backfill side and look at their interaction. The other uh, problem I picked is the foundations for uh, wind turbines. This is a very, very hot topic. Uh, in the UK, but now it's picking up pace both in Japan and uh, in Taiwan, and very soon it will be along the Ca Californian coast as well, all highly seismic areas. So we, we started research on uh, looking at the seismic behavior of these offshore monopile foundations and also some onshore raft foundations. And I'll uh, end up with a brief summary. Now, as you probably heard before, the centrifuge modeling to investigate earthquake loading on civil engineering infrastructure has established itself as a very useful technique. 
is very useful because you can uh, test on small scale models at high gravity in a centrifuge and you can uh, understand the behavior of these structures without the need to actually wait for a real earthquake to happen and damage uh, uh, civil engineering infrastructure. So, uh, and also uh, you might have come across this before that the dynamic centrifuge modeling has been very widely used to study liquefaction problems. There've been relatively less use of this technique to look at the soil structure interaction problems. And in a way, that's what I'm going to focus on today, the soil structure interaction without liquefaction and also some cases where there is liquefaction of the soil. Okay, in, by way of introduction, what is soil structure interaction? Soil structure interaction between structures and so, uh, is the interaction between the structures and soil during a loading event, such that the response of one is influenced by the other. Let us consider a very simple example of a cantilever sheet pile wall. Uh, a retaining wall as shown in the figure. And normally it's easy for us to identify the active wedge and the passive wedge. Uh, and the active wedge causes the disturbing force uh, marked with a yellow arrow here. And the passive wedge provides the resistance marked by a uh, yellow arrow going from left to right. Now, clearly how much force is applied on the retaining wall depends on both the wall stiffness and deformation, of course, and the soil stiffness and deformation. Um, the reason is that depending on the wall stiffness, it will undergo some amount of, say, bending and uh, undergo some deformation. And the amount of strain mobilized uh, behind the wall and in front of the wall is a function of this. And depending on how much strain is mobilized, you mobilize the uh, passive pressure uh, and therefore uh, the one, uh, the whole wall comes to equilibrium under the action of both of these components. So both wall stiffness and deformation and soil stiffness and deformation are important. And therefore it's a classical soil structure interaction problem. Similarly, we can look at dynamic soil structure interaction following on from before. It is the interplay between the structure and the uh, soil foundations during a dynamic event. And the, uh, just like the static SSI, the dynamic SSI uh, occurs because the response of one is influenced by the other. So both are uh, important for us. Now, if you consider a structure on a soil bed, and let's suppose for simplicity, it is just a simple raft foundation and that the soil layer extends to infinity in the lateral directions, that is the semi-infinite house space. Now, if you, uh, once the earthquake loading occurs, the rocking of the structure uh, will occur about the center of gravity of the structure. And this results to the stamping of the feet on both sides. Uh, this causes a variation in the vertical stress and proportional to the vertical stress that's being generated, the stiffness of the soil changes. And therefore that changes the properties of the soil, if you like, and that affects the, how the structure will respond. So the dynamic uh, behavior of the structure depends on the stiffness of the structure. Let's say it's a function of the flexural stiffness, the height of the stories, et cetera. And the stiffness of the soil depends upon the Young's modulus, shear modulus, word ratio, and the effective st vertical stress, et cetera. Let's look at a, a simple example. Uh, here I'm going to show you a couple of uh, uh, pictures. Uh, there are two experiments. It's a simple portal frame model that has, uh, you can uh, test this on a uh, fairly uh, rudimentary shaking table we have. And you can shake this about firstly by uh, fixing it to the ground uh, so that only structural vibrations occur. And next you can make a bed of sand, put the structure on the top and shake it. We are monitoring the accelerations at every floor level. So the amplification factor just let's define that as top floor acceleration by the input acceleration to the table. If you do that and in the two experiments, you can get responses like this. At the top, in the top figure, you can see that the uh, structure with the fixed base responds with the peak response at about, let's say 3.2 Hertz or something. Uh, for the same earthquake, when the structure is placed on the sand, the natural frequency drops and the peak response also drops. 
So you can see the natural frequency in the bottom figure has come down to about 2.3 hertz, and the amplitude uh, amplification ratio also has reduced. This is expected because soil acts as a damper. This is a very, very simple way to show that the response of the structure actually depends on the what's below the structure. Now, of course, uh, that's a very simple experiment. Let's try and extend this to uh, a single degree uh, sway frame structure. Let's say it's placed on a sand layer. Now the soil around the uh, foundation is going to interact with the vibrations of the structure. And let's suppose we're applying the earthquake loading at the base as shown by the bottom arrow. Now here is a video of, from a, a 50G centrifuge test we have carried, uh, carried out. And you can see uh, the lift, the stamping of the feet, as I explained earlier, when the earthquake occurs. <laughs> now, clearly, um, in order to see this, we had to record this video at about 1,000 frames a second uh, during a 50G centrifuge test. So we have a fast camera that can do that. Now, looking at this <laughs> image itself is, OK, we can see now how the structure and the soil are interacting. But what's more interesting is to actually look at, uh, use those images and apply the uh, particle image velocimetry to it. And then you can uh, obtain the soil deformations uh, during the earthquake as indicated by the arrows here. If you are more interested, there's a paper we have written some years ago now uh, in geotechnique, which you can uh, follow. But the important point is that we are able to get the soil deformations below the foundation uh, of a structure and clearly see the interaction between the two. Now, I briefly mentioned there that we use uh, centrifuge testing. Uh, let me introduce the basic principles. As I said before, I'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, centrifuge modeling is very simple. You basically reduce, uh, build a physical model, which is n times smaller than the actual prototype you're uh, testing and test it in a increased gravity uh, uh, field of the centrifuge where the gravity is n times larger than 1g. If you do that, then prototype stresses and strains are recreated in the model. Therefore, the soil will respond with the right stiffness uh, more than anything else. And because we are uh, capturing this uh, right stiffness, that means we are capturing the nonlinear behavior of the soil correctly. This won't happen if you're trying to do a small scale test like I have shown you in the shaking table experiment earlier on. This is the reason why we need a centrifuge to do this. But in order to <laughs> create an earthquake loading, uh, we need to apply lateral shaking for models that are flying around in a centrifuge. In our case, the model is flying at about 200 miles an hour. So while it's going around in the centrifuge, we need to be able to shake it. For this, you need fairly powerful earthquake actuators. Here is a picture of our uh, 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 centrifuge. Uh, it's fairly old. It's built in 1975. And it's a, a fantastic machine. It's about 10 meters in diameter. And we call it the Turner Beam Centrifuge after Philip Turner, who designed uh, the uh, facility. As I explained, by doing this, we'll create the prototype stress and strains. And we also need to have these specialist earthquake actuators and uh, model uh, containers to minimize the boundary effects so that we capture the same infinite extent of our uh, soil. Uh, the principle of centrifuge modeling, if you're interested, it's very easy. It can be done on the, literally on the back of an envelope. And if I were to consider just a, a block whose dimensions are, are LB and H, the vertical stress exerted by that block is going to be MG or LB. And let's say the strain uh, below this uh, block is defined by some characteristic length alpha. So the strain will be delta alpha over alpha. So change in length over length. If I want to uh, do the same thing for a block that is the same block that is scaled down by a factor of n, so the length is L over n, the breadth is B over n, and height is H over n, then the mass of the block is going to be M over n cubed because you squashed it in all dimensions. And if I increase the gravity by a factor of n, and so I'm applying ng in the vertical direction. And if I recalculate my vertical stress, it's going to be m over n cubed times ng over l uh, divided by l over n times b over n 
So you can see I can record the same vertical stress as in the bigger uh, structure, bigger block. Similarly, the strain will also come out to be the same. So the principle of centrifuge modeling is very, very easy to understand. Uh, <coughs> if you're interested in more, uh, more interested in this, you can look up the book uh, I have written in uh, a few years ago. Um, as I said before, we need some specialist earthquake uh, actuators. Let me introduce the, that. And we also need to have the scaling laws which link the behavior of our model to the prototype. Most of these scaling laws are fairly simple to derive. For example, length, obviously we are scaling everything by a factor of n, and therefore mass is all m, uh, one over n cubed, stress and strain are one as required, and other properties we can very easily derive. When it comes to dynamic events, the time scales is one over n, which means the frequency of the event needs to be increased by a factor of n. And similarly, the acceleration goes up by a factor of n as well, which is uh, uh, consistent with the increase in gravity. <laughs> the first earthquake actuator that I was involved with was this uh, uh, in the development of uh, uh, the earthquake actuator was this stored angular momentum earthquake actuator. This is a very cheap and cheerful earthquake actuator. You have a, a cheap Italian motor that can uh, store energy into a flywheel, just like in your car. And then the, the energy that's stored in the flywheel is transferred to the shaking of the, uh, uh, the model container. And this is a very, very robust machine we built. And we need the only cr critical component here is a fast acting clutch, because the clutch needs to come on to grip the moving part and the non-moving part in less than about 10 milliseconds. Uh, with this, we could uh, apply earthquakes of any frequency we want. Here is an example of a 1.8 uh, hertz shake uh, you can see at the top. We can also switch off the motor while the, once the clutch engages and run it down. So you can get a, a swept sine wave through this. <clears throat> of course, the modern day fashion is to be able to apply realistic earthquakes. So we built this uh, more expensive and all singing, all dancing servo hydraulic earthquake actuator. This is able to follow any input motion you give to it. For example, the Kobe motion is shown on the top that was obtained using this machine and the Imperial Valley motion, which is a very long motion with very high frequency content. It's uh, able to successfully reproduce. <laughs> you also <laughs> excuse me, need specialist model containers. Uh, here is the laminar box, which is able to uh, uh, it's almost has no lateral stiffness. Therefore, the soil can move wherever it wants to. The length of this uh, corresponds to 40 meters. Depth is about 20 meters and uh, width is about 14 meters. This is at 60 G. And we have other model containers which are even deeper uh, and can go up to 25 meters at 60 G or even deeper if you test it at 80 G. Now, if you look at these dimensions, these are much, much larger than even the largest shaking table there is in the world. You may have heard from um, Professor, uh, my friend, uh, Ahmed uh, Algamal, who has the very large shaking table in San Diego, and that is a fantastic facility. And even that cannot take, uh, uh, our models are uh, at the prototype scale are bigger than his. But of course, he can do a lot more detailed physical models of the structures and so on. So there are pros and cons. Uh, here is another container where we have a glass site. The one I showed you earlier is taken using this one, where we're able to see what's happening to the soil during the shaking using a fast camera. OK, that's all the uh, kit we uh, have developed over the years. And I'm going to now focus on the actual uh, problems uh, we have studied using this. Um, uh, recently. Uh, the first one I picked was the modeling of anchored uh, steel sheet pile walls. This is work is done with our PhD student, Alessandro Fusco, and my colleagues, uh, Giulia Vigiani, and we had an industrial partner, Cecil Prum of ArcelorMittal. So obviously, with ArcelorMittal, they're interested in uh, steel sheet pile walls. And one of the uh, key cases is this anchored uh, steel uh, sheet pile walls 
used as retaining structures. And you can see them, uh, I put some uh, figures in here, where typically you have water tables slightly lower and uh, you try to anchor them some distance away into the back. Uh, obviously, these things can fail post-earthquake. Uh, you can have a local failure uh, where the whole system uh, can simply translate horizontally, or you can have a global failure where you involve the backfill soil to fail as well. So you can either pull the anchor through with the uh, anchor sheet in the back, as seen on the top, or the whole soil can move on the uh, in the bottom. So those are the uh, you can guess these are the failure mechanisms. But is that what's going to really happen? Let's have a look. So we use a centrifuge facility and this transparent box. And here is a camera, the fast digital camera that is looking at the steel, uh, the anchored sheet pile walls from this side. So the shaking is happening in the direction um, parallel to the base of the uh, model container. So you can, and I'm going to focus on two particular tests. One is, uh, AF03, uh, where we have this anchor uh, uh, length of about 17 meters um, at prototype scale, and it's embedded at a depth of about half a meter. In the second case, the length of the anchor was reduced to 12 meters. Also, the point of anchor in the first test is about is uh, uh, a third from the top. And uh, if you know the soil mechanics, uh, you obviously won't do that you would attach it at the bottom third point at about a depth of 1.25 meters. Therefore, you have an inclined anchor. We are able to, and the, the cross-sectional views of the pictures look something like this before any earthquake were, was applied. These images were taken, obviously, in flight. There are lots of instruments. I'm not going to spend too long on this, but because the data is presented in a very visual format. But as you can see, there are a lot of uh, instruments to measure the accelerations within the soil bed, the settlements, as well as the anchor force uh, with a load cell in the anchor line itself. So we're applying the input motion at the base. Uh, the left-hand one is the uh, AF03, the right one is the AF04. And the input motion is about the same for both. And it's about, say, something like 0.3 G or uh, thereabouts. So that is transmitted through the uh, soil. And you get to the top. And you can see uh, that the acceleration obviously is changing. And we're also able to mark, get the force uh, within the anchor as seen here, and there's clearly some residual force being generated in the long uh, anchor compared to the short anchor, more residual force in the long anchor than the short anchor. So this is the real data presented at prototype scale. Okay, of course, if you're designing these walls, you're interested in the bending moments and how do they change. On the top, you can see the uh, uh, bending moments uh, observed in the wall for the uh, AF03. And when you have a short anchor, clearly you got a, a larger bending moments. You can look at either the maximums or the residual values. In fact, the residual value of the bending moments are pretty similar for both, but the uh, uh, peaks, uh, the peak bending moment is larger uh, in case of AF04. The dynamic moment is larger for AF04 with short anchor length. Okay, what about deformations? This, uh, the displacement of the walls are marked on the right, and you can see uh, earthquake after earthquake, the wall is trying to move outwards, uh, as you'd expect, and it accumulates the displacement because the wall obviously can't go backwards. What's also interesting is to see what this anchor wall is doing at the back end. So you can see the initially it started almost straight, and with uh, successive earthquakes, it is rotating. Because we are pulling it at the top third point, it makes sense that the, uh, the anchor plate rotates in that direction. When it comes to AF04, you can see that the anchor wall is rotating. The, the main wall uh, moves outwards, uh, as you would expect, but the anchor wall is 
actually not rotating that much for most of the earthquakes. Only when we applied really large earthquake, it, it did it rotate a little bit backwards, which is a very good thing. So we'll expect for the top wall, the top wall to have some kind of a local failure, whereas the short anchor wall to have a, 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 a global failure. You can also get the displacements at uh, different uh, locations. You, you can get these in, in the uh, uh, prototype scale. Clearly, the short anchor gave rise to much, uh, almost uh, half a meter of movement, uh, cycle by cycle. You can see how it's evolving. Whereas when it comes to the uh, long anchor, the movements are about half, 25 uh, centimeters or so, a quarter of a meter. OK, that's all good. Uh, because we are having this fast uh, camera taking images, we can do the PI view on this. And here are the contours of the horizontal displacement. And from that, you can also work out the shear strains and plot this. So these are the shear strains are computed from the displacements, uh, which is fairly straightforward to do. Now, clearly, you can see when the anchor length is long, as we expected, the failure happens, the displacements are largest just behind the wall and also just in front of the uh, anchor plate. Whereas when the anchor length is quite small, you can see got a global failure where the whole thing is trying to move with the large displacements uh, happening all over. And you can also identify the boundary between where the shear strains are uh, really concentrated. So it's kind of uh, uh, straight from the horse's mouth, as it were. You can say, get exactly what the failure mechanism is. So in summary, the deformation mechanisms behind the anchored uh, retaining walls were investigated. The difference between the wall deformation and uh, where, when the anchor length uh, is changed were identified. The deformations of anchor wall changes depends on the anchor location and the global and local failure mechanisms were clearly obtained. So that's a, a nice piece of work. We're of course uh, doing the um, analysis on this and more publications will come, I'm sure, as we go along. The next one is more recent work. This is all uh, post COVID uh, lockdown. So uh, I wanted to share this with you. It's a quite uh, a, a nice thing uh, to look at where you tend to increasingly we're uh, having structures coming very close to retaining walls for, uh, especially in the urban environment. Uh, here is a picture where you can see a big structure next to a, a fairly uh, a deep retaining wall of about 15 meters or so. And what happens if an earthquake happens to uh, these kind of structures and the retaining walls? So clearly it's a big soil section interaction problem. Not only you've got the retaining wall with the backfill, but you're putting a, a big structure behind it. You can also make a little analytical models of these things where you simplify the structure as a portal frame with the eccentric mass on the top and model it as a single degree freedom system just to get the initial natural frequency and so on. So we uh, you, uh, did two things with this. One is uh, we ran the numerical analysis um, uh, using Swandine, which is a, a, a finite element code. Um, with and without the, uh, the structure in place. So on the left hand side, there's no structure, just the retaining wall. On the right hand side, there is the structure uh, in the backfill side. And the foundations of this uh, structure are just footing, uh, strip footings uh, separated by each other, as you can see in this figure. We, uh, side by side, we're also running the centrifuge stress of this, where the wall itself, the cantilever wall itself is, uh, uh, strain gauge so we can get the bending moments for it. We can also monitor what's going on to, uh, with the structure. So with this, uh, yeah, in the right hand side, you can see the physical model of that. First thing is because we are doing a numerical analysis, we can obviously get the horizontal uh, stress contours uh, for both cases. So on the left hand side, you can see you've got the passive pressures developing at the base of the wall which are clearly much larger when you have the structure. That part is fairly uncontroversial. 
of course, once you got the infinite element analysis, you can get whatever you want. So we got the lateral earth pressures, see how they compare with the, uh, say, Coulomb's uh, uh, active and passive pressures. And you can see the Coulomb's, uh, because Coulomb's theory gives you a limit, uh, earth, limiting earth pressure, you can see that the uh, actual earth pressures mobilized uh, as predicted by the FE analysis are much smaller than the triangular, which you imagine, because the soil does not get to, you, uh, the amount of passive pressure you get depends on how much strain you mobilized. If the uh, soil is not straining all that much, obviously your passive pressures are not going to get anywhere near the Coulomb's limiting earth pressure. Similarly, we can get the active pressures behind the wall. Uh, we can do that and compare what's happening when there is structure and when there is no structure. And you can see that uh, on the active side, when there is structure, there's a, a bigger bulge because of the presence of the structure. Whereas uh, the, um, when there's no structure, the yellow markers show very little uh, um, variation from top to bottom. They're just triangular uh, with depth. Similarly, we can get the bending moments, as you can see on the right here. These are normalized bending moments we're plotting. Uh, I do uh, ask your uh, apologies for uh, the following slightly weird sign convention, which is followed by our undergraduates here. Uh, so you, but uh, irrespective of sign convention, you can see when there is no structure, the bending moments are smaller. And when there is structure, the bending moments in the wall are much larger. So clearly there is a, big effect of having the structure in the back. No, uh, no prizes for guessing that. But what, these are all static analysis, but what happens when you apply earthquake loading? So we applied these uh, earthquake motions at the base. Again, this is all still numerical, I must uh, insist. And you can follow what's happening on the left hand. So we are considering two cycle. One is the first cycle and another cycle in B is towards the end of the earthquake. And what you can see at a shot uh, in the top uh, uh, four figures on the left is that the bending moment uh, with the structure is larger than when there is no structure, even uh, at any point of the cycle. And also, as the earthquake progresses, it seems that you get residual bending moments building up and by the end of the earthquake, you can see much larger increase in the bending moments where there is the structure in the backfill compared to when there is no structure. So this is quite interesting. That means that if you have the structure, uh, cycle on cycle, you build up these bending moments and they stay there uh, with you for a long time. And especially if you are expecting multiple earthquakes at the same site, say some small earthquakes and large earthquakes, your walls are going to see increasing levels of bending moment. And that's worth knowing. Uh, when it comes to experiments on this, you can of course use this PIV technique and get the displacements, like, just like what we did with the anchored steel uh, sheet pile walls before. You can see that the, uh, the displacements behind uh, just uh, when there is no structure case are largest uh, obviously behind the wall at the top and they kind of uh, decrease uh, as the contours are showing uh, into uh, dark blue which means there is not much movement at all. When it comes to the structure this pattern completely changes and this is the uh, nice and controversial bit here. Because I got the strip footings behind the uh, uh, retaining wall, you can, it seems that these uh, soil deformations are quite localized, especially underneath the right footing. And the left footing is also seeing a bit of displacements, but not as much. But you can see there's no, the wedge, uh, if you want to call it that, of deformation is much more narrower when there is structure. This uh, somehow indicates that the Placing the structure is kind of stabilizing my soil, which is an interesting uh, observation, which I wouldn't have guessed without doing the experiments and seeing these results. So that is a fun thing to know. Of course, from the experiments also, we can measure the bending movements. Again, we're plotting the same way. Here, uh, uh, first the envelope of bending moments here with and without the structure, and clearly having the structure gives you a larger bending moment. And 
you can also look at the residual bending moments after a strong earthquake. So this is nice. Of course, we can get the rotation of the uh, wall and that of the structure. And clearly, the structure starts uh, suffers a lot more rotation when the wall moves out because there, it's losing the soil from the right-hand side foundation. So the whole structure tends to rotate uh, uh, towards the wall. So th this is all quite interesting and new. So if you're more keen, you, there are uh, one publication that you can already download and have a look. That's on the numerical modeling of structures adjacent to, struct uh, adjacent to retaining walls. Uh, and the other one we have is still under review. So hopefully that will come out soon. But in summary, the presence of the structure uh, on the back uh, on the backfill side of a retaining wall uh, affects both the static and dynamic bending moments. I hope I demonstrated that. The backfill displacements are altered by the foundations of the structure. And this is a very clear in indication of soil structure interaction case. So I've got two more things to talk about. One is the offshore uh, monopile foundations working with my PhD student Juntai Siong and my colleague Dr. Crystal Abadi. Uh, I try to go quickly here. Uh, I believe I still have about uh, 10 minutes, Professor Swami Saran, I hope. Um, do stop me if I'm overrunning. Um, uh, the monopiles are very interesting because they're really large circular steel piles. And these are used, preferred by the construction industry to support offshore wind farms. Uh, especially in the UK. And these are about, uh, they're getting bigger all the time. They're about eight meters in diameter uh, in uh, today's designs. And you can see a person standing next to uh, a, a large monopile uh, uh, there. So the objectives of this particular research was fairly straightforward. What we want to see is to look at the pre and post uh, earthquake lateral capacity of these large piles also to apply a swept sine wave motion to identify the natural frequency in flight uh, and apply a strong earthquake set its natural frequency two times natural frequency and three times natural frequency we want to measure the dynamic bending moments in the monopile also identify the dynamic response of the tower later on so the cross section of the model is fairly uh, simple we are looking at layered configuration which is quite typical so the monopile goes through a loose uh, sand uh, of about six meters deep, and it is embedded into dense sand, which uh, has a relative density of about 90%. Um, and the total length of the pile embedded is about 12 meters. This is slightly on the lower side. The real piles are a bit larger, but as an example, this is fine. We also have kit on the top, which are two actuators. So we use one of these piles to push, uh, push it out to get the capacity, uh, lateral capacity of the pile before the any earthquake is applied. Then we do our uh, all the earthquakes. And once all the tests are done, we push over the second pile to get the post earthquake lateral capacity. That's the plan. So we've got two actuators and two pile setups here. So these are the two, uh, how they look in uh, reality. So we're modeling the mass, uh, the uh, overhead mass using these brass uh, weights on the top and the piles themselves are going uh, deep below. And here's a close up of the same thing with these actuators in physical form. And these are uh, taken obviously with the model on the centrifuge itself. So the first business here is to apply a, a sign sweep and see what the model does. So the sign sweep is a fairly small earthquake we're applying about 0.05 G. And firstly, in the dense sand layer, uh, uh, the lower sand, uh, dense sand layer, not much happens. You can see there's a bit of amplification, but nothing to write home about. When it comes to loose sand layer, you can see that the soil uh, obviously is amplifying the input motion and you can see uh, the increase in amplitudes as you get to the surface of the soil, as you would expect. However, if you look at the response of the tower itself, although I'm putting no more than 0.05 G here, my uh, the top of the piles are responding with fairly high uh, acceleration when you are hitting this with the uh, um, uh, because you are picking on the natural frequency of the uh, uh, of the pile soil system. 
So using this, we identify its natural frequency and uh, we do a FFT clearly to get this. And this is about 0.5 Hertz, let's say. It's less than 0.5, but call it 0.5 for now. And we hit this uh, firstly with the Kobe motion. And again, you can see the tower response is fairly small. We are applying some 0.15 G of scaled Kobe motion and nothing much happens in the tower. But if I hit it with uh, uh, the same 0.15 G of, uh, uh, of sinusoidal motion, but now at the natural frequency, you can see the response of the tower has gone mad. It's more than 0.6 G. So clearly, natural frequency is a bad thing. But if I hit the same thing with, uh, uh, sorry, uh, you can also get the bending moments when these things, uh, uh, when this uh, was applied, uh, when we applied an earthquake at natural frequency and see what are the peak bending moments are. And if you hit the same uh, structure with uh, two times the natural frequency, you can see the response is completely right. I'm applying the same 0.15 or 0.2G, and you can see the tower is not, uh, the top of the pile is not responding at all. Uh, because you are uh, two times further away from the natural frequency. Then we did this pushover test, and you can see that this pushover uh, test uh, before and after, you can see that the capacity uh, of the... Um, uh, okay, so we are plotting horizontal displacement on x-axis and the horizontal load on the y-axis in megaNewton oh, meters. Five yeah. minutes more, please. Five minutes more, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let's look at the normalized version of this, where you can see that the uh, if I plot the uh, about say up to 0.16 uh, uh, of some kind of normalized uh, displacement, uh, you can see that the uh, post earthquake I can get quite a big increase in uh, the peak load compared to the uh, pre-earthquake situation, but the key is that the initial stiffness has gone down. And this is very interesting. But of course, uh, we need to be a bit careful here because the dynamic response um, uh, of the system is quite large uh, is when the an earthquake frequency matches the natural frequency of the soil monopile system. But during realistic earthquakes, the uh, of the earthquake frequency range, the response is quite small. The pushover capacity increases, but the initial stiffness is smaller. This has serious consequences in the design phase of monopiles in seismic regions. And we are, of course, doing a lot more work on this, including soil liquefaction. So last thing is the onshore raft foundations with wind turbines. And this work we're carrying out with uh, my colleagues, Jun Tai Xiong, Dr. Haig and Professor Vijayani, and in collaboration with Adani uh, Green Energy Limited. And this is a case where we're looking at, uh, at an onshore raft foundation on liquefiable soil. So we're, I'm going to talk about two tests. One is an ATG test and uh, both, sorry, both are ATG tests, but one without any ground improvement and another one with stone column array of nine by nine uh, stone columns. So there are uh, nearly 81 uh, stone columns here. So the first one is simply, again, layered soil, the top liquefiable layer with a lower, denser, non-liquefiable soil, if you uh, follow that. And here are some details of how we made the model, but that's not important right now. Uh, so the, in the second uh, test, we have these uh, drains going all the way through the loose layer into the dense layer. And we constructed this quite painfully, as you can see in the bottom pictures, where we drive aluminum piles, fill the aluminum pile with the uh, uh, coarse sand, and then you tamp it to get the right density. So that's all and, uh, in model making. We also measure the in-flight the soil stiffness using air hammer, and we could show, uh, we could see where the loose sand is transitioning into dense sand uh, in that way. Okay, firstly, I'm going to talk about Imperial Valley, where you got uh, uh, a very small earthquake being applied, less than 0.05 G. And you can see the foundation, there's a bit of amplification, but if you look at the tower, it picks up the natural frequency of the uh, tower and it starts to isolate quite, quite a lot. And if I were to plot 
the displacements of this, you can see the tower displacements appears to be quite big. But if you actually look at the magnitude, it's still <clears throat> at prototype scale, only 0 0.05 <clears throat> or 0 0.04 meters. So the actual lateral displacements are negligible. What about the settlement? The most biggest concern for these things is the settlement and rotation. You can see I got a bit of settlement of the surface and a little bit of settlement on the, uh, of the foundation itself for a very small earthquake. And the rotation is almost negligible. However, when I apply a bigger earthquake at one hertz, then you can see uh, two interesting things happen, that the uh, tower itself does not respond very much when it comes to the first AGL uh, one case where there's no ground improvement and the accelerations are reduced because of soil as liquefied. Whereas if you look at the uh, drained case, the accelerations are much larger, but uh, that also confirms that there has no, been no liquefaction. That is one good thing. Similar, uh, similar to before, we can look at the displacements. Now you can see that the, uh, the tower is not displacing uh, at all because it does, does not participate in these vibrations. Its natural frequency is much, much lower than the one hertz we're applying. But if you look at the settlements, which is the most important thing, when you have just the uh, normal soil, just in one earthquake, it has settled more than 0.25 meters. But when you improve the ground with the drains for the AGL3 uh, case, the settlements are much, much smaller. Similarly, if you look at the rotations of the foundation, which is a critical uh, performance criteria for these things, anything more than half a degree, you cannot have. You can see for AGL01 case, it has the rotations have gone to almost one degree post earthquake, whereas when we have drains, the uh, rotations are much, much smaller. And here are some post test pictures where you can see what happened to the drains before and after, and also the soil layer itself when it before and after. This is a complex problem. But in summary, what we can say is that the uh, onshore wind turbines on liquefiable soils are very susceptible to settlements and rotations, and installation of stone columns seem to have uh, mitigated this, uh, most of the settlement damage. And uh, however, the price you pay is that there'll be inc increased structural seismic response due to increased stiffness, and there is an optimization you can make between how much settlement you can tolerate and how much accelerations you're willing to accept. Okay, in summary, I hope I have demonstrated in the last uh, 15 minutes or so uh, that the dynamic centrifuge modeling is a very neat way to study soil state interaction problems. We're able to use this technique in more and more so sophisticated structural and soil models. I, today I have used anchor sheet file walls to investigate the PI, uh, using PIV to identify global versus local failure mechanisms and the later shown to be to afford a lot more resilience against strong earthquakes. The structures in close proximity of retaining walls, again, some very interesting observations came out of that, both in terms of static and dynamic bending moments. Offshore monopiles, where you can see that it's an emerging area of research, but already we can see what difference we can bring by understanding these things. And finally, onshore wind turbines, where ground improvement seems to play a very nice and important role in controlling settlements and rotations. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much, Professor Gopal, for your very lucid and interesting presentation in which you had presented the soil structure interaction problems in a very and we learned many things from your lecture. Now I will request my co-chairman, Dr. Krishna, if he has some questions or observations. Uh, thank you, Professor. Dr. Ram Krishna. Yes, sir. I'm here. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I request the audience to post any questions that you have uh, in the online platform, in the 3D platform. On the top left, you can see your question and answers box. You can click that and type in your questions real time. Uh, if any of the uh, audience have any questions, please uh, feel free to type in your questions. Now. Thank you.
I think probably the questions will uh, follow towards the end of both the sessions. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, even if there are any questions from panelists, they can also. Yeah. Any questions from the panelists? No. All right. So we're having evening tea. <laughs> Professor Gopal, I yeah. have an observation. Actually, I am when I was working with this swellish interaction problems, I was feeling one difficulty. Say, what amount of the soil should be taken into account? This is a uh, mass of the soil mm -hmm. plays a very important role in these problems. So you can model, model your interface, you can model many things, but what about the quantity? That's a very interesting question. One thing we did not in the presentation I made today, but uh, I had a, an interesting uh, uh, master's students uh, a couple of years ago called uh, Jing Dong. And one thing we looked at was uh, uh, to try and back calculate the response uh, by keeping the uh, mass of the soil as a variable. And uh, she came up with uh, quite interesting figures. Normally, uh, I was kind of expecting something like, say, you got the mass of the structure just as a raw mass and work out how much soil you, uh, you by rule of thumb will participate in the vibration with the structure like you would do in a say machine foundation case. Um, you would get, uh, I was always under the impression it probably will be a factor of 20 or 50, a big number like that. And once we had done this uh, centrifuge test and we basically, what we were trying to do is to see how the response changes. If I keep changing the mass on the, the vibrating mass of the structure and uh, see how the natural frequency it changes from being a fixed uh, base natural frequency. And that should be the, how much soil participates because I have a good uh, feel for the stiffness. So the natural frequency I can interpret as the change in uh, the amount of soil mass participating. And her numbers were coming about five or between five and seven, uh, which is very interesting uh, to know. But uh, I must qualify that statement with the uh, vibrations she was applying were fairly small because we did not want to get into the non really nonlinear range of the soil because then the stiffness also changes quite dramatically. The big problem uh, with soil liquefaction is that if, it, uh, if you, at full liquefaction, you are expecting almost no stiffness. So you're kind of changing, moving the system from having a very uh, noticeable high natural frequency towards something that has uh, almost no natural frequency. Uh, so it's just going to fall over. Uh, so because your stiffness is changing so much, uh, how do you simultaneously track the, how much soil mass is participating with it is a tricky problem. But for small amplitude uh, shaking, I would, uh, our, Experiments are suggesting somewhere like between five and seven, um, but for larger amplitude, uh, it's still an open question. It's a, an excellent question. It's a bit like uh, damping in the soil. N not many people have a good firm handle on uh, damping in the soil either. Um, again, for liquefied soil, we are getting damping values between 20% and 30%, which is, look quite big. But that, that's what the data says. As the soil liquefies, you get a lot more damping. Uh, maybe we, I can see the Q&A here. Yeah. Uh, Professor, we have a few questions in the Q&A. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, one question is, how accurately the centrifuge tests can capture the real field conditions? Can it be quantified? How about the soil particle size scaling? 
uh, that's a most stand box standard question for me uh, first let me deal with the soil uh, particle issue okay everybody asks this why are you not scaling the soil uh, first thing is if you scale the soil particles themselves by say a factor of uh, 50 or 100 then your uh, soil classification changes from being say fine sand to maybe silt or something if you reduce the size of a fine sand particle by 100 it becomes uh, fine silt so that's not and then the constitute behavior changes so that's not the way to go my first question is uh, in soil mechanics we always uh, treat soil as a continuum and that's the basis of any finite element analysis other than the discrete element modeling every other modeling technique we have come up with to analyze our problem assume that the soil is a continuum so if you assume that the soil is continuum then we are basically doing the same thing uh, except that we we haven't got uh, instead of uh, millions and millions and millions of particles uh, billions and billions of particles in the field we got millions of particles in a centrifuge model okay it's a factor smaller but we got uh, sufficiently large particles uh, i could simply say that well we got um, my professor andrew scofield always used to say one centrifuge test is like doing 10000 triaxial tests if you look at the how much soil you have in a triaxial sample and uh, see how many particles there are in a centrifuge model it's a factor of at least 10000 if not more so we have a lot more soil than in the field in terms of inclusions say you want to look at the soil sector interaction which is what i was talking about today then you must make sure that your uh, anything you're uh, uh, inserting into the soil has enough particles to be in contact if you follow say fumio tutsioka's shear band theory and how many particles are required to form the shear band he suggests that must be at least a factor of 15 or 20 so as long as your inclusion has say 50 or more particles the fact that you got a lot more particles in the prototype doesn't matter and you can check thank that thank you once again professor so, gopal let us wind up this one Hello? okay kya yeah. hua okay so that that's the uh, uh, quick answer for that in terms of modeling to uh, realistic conditions we are getting much much better now for example the last project i was talking about has a clay layer a, fine, uh, a liquid fiber layer and a, a coarse sand layer but if you in the field you normally gets a lot of heterogeneities and stuff you don't want to include that in a centrifuge model because at the end of the day you want to have a repeatable model but the number of layers we are increasing and we are making more and more complex uh, models all the time uh professor swamisharan uh, sir can we have one more question we got a number of questions in the q and a yeah I, i can see there is uh, there are some very interesting questions uh one by sai cut kuli the structure yeah. beside the wall has been simplified into a portal frame with its footing resting on the surface and analyzed no the footing was actually embedded uh, in the into the ground uh, my question is how did you take into account effect of earthquake on the wall due to the embedment of the structures foundation uh, we don't have to you uh, create the whole model shake the at the apply the earthquake at the foundation and what will happen is what we observe so all that is at, accounted for automatically both in the finite element analysis as well as in the centrifuge so that's all uh, because our finite element analysis is in the in time domain all we need to do is to make the mesh the constitute models are the complicated part of it but i haven't got the time to go into that today all right uh, thank you uh, professor gopal mathushi okay okay thank you very much now we came to the end of the session now i am requesting to professor jaka if he wants to announce something on behalf of organizing committee we thank 
our both the keynote speakers professor gopal madhubushi and professor tohota for kindly accepting our invitation and delivering today's excellent lectures thank you both thank you both and i also uh thank on behalf of organizing committee our chair professor swami saran in spite of diffi technical difficulties he managed ha very hard to attend our uh, session and manage uh, handle it thank you very much sir i also thank co chair dr ramakrishnan for effectively managing the session thank you one and all and now there is after a uh, few minutes grand cultural event is going to be start and our colleagues dr parth sardi and dr srivalsa made lot of efforts for the um, cultural evening so uh, i request all of you to join and experience culture indian culture